Okay, my mother. My mother drove me 150 miles to buy my first bra. Apparently, there wasn't a single one in northern New Hampshire small enough to fit me. <laughs> but she was a tireless hunter, and my breasts had been bugging her for nearly two years. They sat on my chest like a couple of newly cracked eggs. Not, not grade A free-range chicken eggs. More like pigeon or quail. <laughs> my mother worried about those eggs. My shirts were too thin. They showed too much yolk, I guess. <laughs> she hated the way I hunched my shoulders and hid myself in baggy sweaters. She wasn't shy when it came to her body, and she found it irritating when her 12-year-old daughter did. Her solution? A girl's trip to Boston, which she called civilization. She marched me into Saks, where 20 minutes later, I shivered, bare-chested, in a dressing room while Mom and the saleswomen shook their heads and put the smallest bras back in the boxes. My mother insisted there must be a solution. She'd driven three, three hours with a cranky preteen, and she wasn't going home without a victory. I stood there naked and powerless, while the two women scrutinized and strategized. I wanted to die. <laughs> Then the saleswoman, a bossy, bosomy woman with a Brooklyn accent and a cigarette laugh, brought out the only option left, a training bra, an elongated Band-Aid with straps and two bits of cotton that flattened my raw little yolks until they looked like they'd been fried over easy. <laughs> my mother and her new best friend stood with the curtain to the dressing room flung open while they surveyed their work. Other customers eyed me and chuckled as they passed to their dressing rooms. Close the curtain, I hissed. We're all women, Mom said. There's no need to be self-conscious. I hated her then. <laughs> I, I, I hated them all. I got through the rest of the day imagining the saleswoman gasping for air as she was strangled with her own brassiere. I imagined a bloody 10-car wreck on our way home that only I would survive. And if by chance my mom did survive, I'd never let her near me or not into a dressing room again with me. But 25 years later, we were once again in Boston for a just us trip. I was in my 30s and taking a break from an ordinary job that my mother insisted on describing as high-powered businesswoman. She was dismayed when she saw my outfit that day, another long baggy sweater over stretchy leggings. But I ignored her and she let it go while we lunched on raw oysters and thick clam chowder before heading to a movie. On the, way to the, on the way to the theater, Mom saw a sign. Saks was having a sale. It, it would, she pointed out, be possible to get to the theater by walking through the store. Her eyes shone, her nostrils quivered. She vanished into Saks and I, full of lunch and empty of suspicion, followed her. I found myself surrounded by expensive designer business suits. Even the sale price was exorbitant. $250 for a skirt and another $350 for a matching jacket. Way out of my budget range. Still, I was eyeing a pair of black silk pants when I heard a sort of chirp behind me. Hi, I'm Carol. I'm the Dana Buckman specialist. May I help you? When I turned, <laughs> I found a tiny parakeet of a woman in a lime green silk mini skirt matching jacket, spike heels, and a glossy pink smile. Her turquoise eyes glittered at me. I edged away and looked over my shoulder for my mother. By the time I looked back, Carol was holding a beautiful black silk black skirt and a great black jacket. The jacket was my size, but the skirt was at least a size too small. Just then, my mother returned. Oh, that's perfect, she said to Carol. My daughter, you know, is a high-powered businesswoman. <laughs> Carol, to her credit, didn't bat an eye. Instead, she invited us to follow her to the dressing room. Now, oh, it would just be a few minutes, I told myself, and the suit was great. Why not at least pretend to be a high-powered businesswoman? Inside the dressing room loomed a large pedestal surrounded by three huge mirrors. I saw my reflection in each of them and quailed a little. My mother told me she was going out to look for a blouse that would complete the outfit. I removed my leggings. I sucked in my stomach, reached for the skirt, zipped it part way. I was happy with what I saw. I peeled off my sweater and climbed up on the pedestal for a better look. Not bad, but it was a little too small. Just then, a knock on the door. 
Honey, it's me. My mother had returned, empty-handed, but still eager to help. She left the door swinging open and launched in. Very nice, smashing, but you definitely need the next size up. Close the door. Oh, that's right, she said. You were always so modest, I never understood why. That was it. I needed to get out of that skirt and get to the movies before she said another word. Then, I noticed the zipper wouldn't move. At least, it would not go down. Mom, something's wrong. My mother adjusted her glasses and stooped to get a better look. Maybe some material caught in it, she said. Reflexively, I yanked. The zipper shot upward and stopped at the waistband, which was now so tight I could not take a complete breath. My mother said, oh my God. She straightened her and she straightened up and stared at my backside at horror. I was gasping. No matter how straight I pulled myself up or attempted to suck it in, a roll of pink and white flab flopped over the top of the waistband. I twisted around to see. The zipper had derailed. The skirt looked split open, exposing my back and the hole in my floral print cotton jockey for her briefs. <laughs> I heard Carol's voice outside the door. Did your mom find you? She sings songs through the louvered doors. Yes, thank you, she's right here. How is everything? Fine, just fine. My mother's eyebrows shot up. I shook my head at her. I have to run over to my manager's office for just a sec. Be right back, okay? Okay. My mother said, don't be crazy, she can help. It's her job. We just need to zip it back down, I said. You hold, I'll pull. All right, she said. She took the outer edges of the zipper and pulled them together. I reached around and pinched the tiny little zipper in my fingers and tugged downward, trying not to breathe any more than I had to. Nothing. My mother snorted out a laugh but reined it in. Barely. Betsy, this thing costs a fortune. You do not want to be the one to ruin it. Keep trying, I ordered. We tugged and pulled, pulled and tugged. Still, nothing. A finger hovered over the panic button inside my brain. I was stuck. I was stuck inside a $250 skirt I couldn't afford to buy in the first place. I looked at my mother and my finger jammed down hard on the panic button. The woman who bore me, nurtured me, and somewhere deep inside must love me, was laughing so hard she could not stand upright. <laughs> she crossed her legs to keep from peeing her pants. Just then, we heard Carol again from behind the door. I'm back, how is everything? <laughs> My mother pulled open the door and fled for the nearest ladies' room. <laughs> you were really determined to get into this skirt, weren't you? Carol said a few minutes later. She was peering at the skirt, trying to assess the level of severity when my mother returned. Carol reached for the zipper. You hold, I'll pull, she said to my mother. We've tried that, mom said. But she grabbed the edges of the ruptured zipper and pulled them together as tight as she could. Carol pulled down with everything she had. Bent at the waist, struggling for breath, I pledged to myself if I were ever released from this bondage, I would never, ever shop with my mother again. I would never try on anything that cost a month's rent. I would wear elastic. <laughs> it's, it's not working, my mother said. We may have to get the jaws of life. This was Carol's attempt at humor. I, stare, I stared into, my, into the mirror at my mother, who collapsed again into another giggle. Because of her, I'd have to wear this skirt like a girdle of shame for the rest of my life. Well, we'll have to call tailoring, Carol said. This time there was silence in the dressing room after she left. What was tailoring? And what would it do that hadn't already been done? Within minutes, there was a short rap on the door, and Carol entered with a tiny woman in a cardigan. Picture Dr. Ruth on a bad day. <laughs> the woman carried a large wicker basket filled with needles, thread, and blades of all sizes. Her mouth was a single grim line. What is the problem? Carol simply pointed to the back of the skirt. Ah, the woman put down the basket and moved in with a determined expression. You will hold, I will pull, she said. <laughs> Carol didn't move. Been there. Ugh, we will have to cut. The woman reached into her basket and pulled out a gleaming set of scissors. She angled them and moved towards the skirt, her lip curled in disgust. 
Then, snip. I could breathe again. Within seconds of my release, Carol and Tailoring escaped with the skirt. It was just Mom and me, shivering in my holy undies, grateful that the store wouldn't make me pay for the skirt. All I wanted was to get to the movie and put the whole thing behind me. Then Mom held up the silk jacket with a wistful look. You know, maybe you could order a larger skirt just to see, she said. Then she caught my eye in the mirror and put the jacket back on the hanger with a sigh. I'll wait outside, she said. She left the door wide open. A scream gathered in my now-released gut. I felt it roaring to my throat. But before I could make a single sound, my mother returned. She smiled gently at me and carefully closed the door behind her. Betsy Morrow, everybody!